Truth Season 9 with Akusia Konedu. Proudly brought to you by Echo Bank. Good evening and welcome to the night season of The Hard Truth, your favorite current affairs program which promises to probe into the hot waters of key national issues. And I promise more intense, informative and revealing interviews with more excitement promised by my guest. Tonight we have a very prominent individual within the Ghanaian banking sector who has had a proven excellent record, not only in Ghana but across Africa. Their mission, they say, is to be a world-class shared service center for the Standard Chartered Group. Mr. Kweku Bedu Ado, the young, dynamic, and enterprising chief executive officer of the Standard Chartered Bank of Ghana, and the very first Ghanaian to hold this prestigious role. He has had far-reaching experience within the banking sector, as well as several years serving within Standard Chartered Bank Zambia, Singapore, Cote d'Ivoire, Gambia, and Sierra Leone. He will delve into his life as a banker, work ethics, motivation, and also get some insight from him on the the banking sector in Ghana. Now, do you think he has a muzzle to offer more than he already has? We would definitely find out in a brief yet probing talk with him. My name is Nana Akosia Kunedu, and this is season nine of The Hard Truth. You watching The Hard Truth and the uh, group CEO or chief as a no, he's not a group CEO. He's a chief executive officer of uh, Standard Chartered Bank Ghana, and with more additional responsibilities as um, to West Africa to cluster. So, welcome to the hard trip. Thank you very much. And uh, how are you enjoying your new role? Oh, I just started, but um, yes, I'm enjoying it. You are enjoying it. You can see from your face and your, from your from your nice suit. Thank you. <laughs> Now, you said that three key elements are to success within the banking sector. Uh, you know, that was what you said was the public sector. You know, you worked in the public sector and you also said that um, uh, you had some very good faith. So, Providence meeting uh, destiny and all that. And maybe your knowledge in um, general knowledge in, in Ghanaian, you know, settings. Why would you say this? Well, that's for my personal journey. Right. That is because... Oh, yeah, I need you to tell me more about that. Well, because um, everyone has a different journey and personal experience. Okay. But if you're talking about my experience, then I believe you are referring to uh, probably an interview I granted so a while back okay. about um, my early experience in the public sector mm -hmm. after university. Uh, the fact that um, it's a case of um, ambition meeting destiny. Uh -huh. A combination of working in the public sector and private sector over time uh -huh. gives you a certain local knowledge and perspective that helps you to take decisions. Uh -huh. So I think, but it, it takes time to get to that level of proficiency. But is the money not factor? Because you mentioned in some interviews that, you know, people work, when you work in the uh, public sector, you get some ideas and know-how and you're able to transcend down to other businesses. But now we look at the money and we're like, no, we're not going to work there. So what, how was the experience like for you those days? I think it, it's something that everybody has to realize globally. Huh. It's very rare for a public sector job to pay more than private sector, generally, huh. as the general norm. In a few countries, there's convergence. Uh, certainly my experience in the public sector was no better, the, the pay was not that exciting. Okay. But, but I you think had some opportunities, always, but you know, opportunities to, to learn you where you are now. Now you realize that we have all veterans there in the public sector, not giving the young people the chance to, you know, bring out their, their best in them and shine. From your time, you know, working in the public sector, mm -hmm. how was it like comparing that to now? What would you say the differences are here? I think the, the challenges are the same. Um, when I worked in the public sector, that was when Ghana was going through structural adjustment and all that. Aren't we still going through that? Exactly. So that's why I say the yeah. challenges remain the right. same. Um, bottom line, I think that we do have economic challenges that makes it difficult for the average person or the average household to have a, a meaningful 
life, right. uh, uh, life with with dignity, and um, I get that, but with hope and aspiration. Exactly. So that's that's what it's all about at yeah. the end of the so day. So you got some opportunities, perhaps we are not getting now. You know, in our generation, what mm. was it? How different was yours from now? Maybe uh, your boss helped you to do some. I, I'm not going to say it for you, but how 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 was that now for you? I think what I would like the younger generation to understand that is that public service is not wasted time. It may not pay, it may not fill your bank account, it may not give you the kind of money you want to do all the things we all want to do, right. but it equips you with a certain level of exposure if you're really hungry for it. You generate a good network of uh, people that you get to know. You get to see at first hand how policy is evolved. And if you're lucky, you can have an input into that policy. No, but if we are not given the opportunity to work in the public sector as a young person because we have old veterans there, how do we get the opportunity to why, why, come why would you? Why would you have that um, perception? I think that surely as people retire, as natural attrition happens, they are recruiting because we did our time there. Well, when I go there now, it's you know an what? entirely different you know generation that I see. We have people who are over 60 years mm. and then you're on contrast, so a long chain of But I think lives. that will be the exception more than the norm. So what, there's still life opportunities I still for young, young people? people. Don't, don't, check, don't check the opportunity to go and work in public service. And it's never changed. People they'll say that ministries, no, 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 I'm not yeah, going to go there. Yeah, exactly. but but trust me, I've been there for almost a decade and it's, it's, it's worth it. Now, let's look at government accessible and at a very high uh, interest rate card in the local market. Now, the private sector is unable to assess loans because of unreasonable rates leading to the stagnation of business. What would you say this is? Why, why is that? Does the government really have to continue in the local market? What should the government do now? Government everywhere in the world raises money through taxes, mm -hmm. the taxes you and I pay mm -hmm. and co companies pay. Um, if it's not enough, they go to the market to borrow. Now, it's all about balance. If they do it excessively, interest rates would go up mm -hmm. and it will crowd out the private sector. If they don't, interest rates can stay moderate. So it's, it's all about balancing there. Mm -hmm. But even the US government borrows. So it's it's a question of the intensity and but, but relative it, to everyone else. isn't it excessive you know mm -hmm. so how much is the interest rate now today since you're oh, in a bank and setting well every bank determines its rate independently but okay. if you want to know yes on a the, bench, bank. the benchmark what you should ask really is that what is the benchmark rate right Which for your bank is what i'm asking anyway standard chartered bank so I'm, I'm asking this because as you, you realize that private business suffer because the government goes for the loan and then huge rates i mean interest rate hence now i i go for loans and it's like, oh my goodness, I can't pay for this interest rate. Yeah, so, so my business suffers. Now, are there innovation uh, for the private sector to use in, in uh, stabilizing their businesses? Yes, um, I can see the evolution of equity business in Ghana. Uh, you, you, increasingly, we are seeing um, uh, venture capital companies coming in. We are seeing private equity players show interest in Africa, not just Ghana. Their capital tends to be longer term because businesses, startup businesses need long term capital. Bank capital is often not, not long term. Right. Okay, so I think that business businesses must also get to understand uh, finance a bit better and what we call capital structure and what should you use as debt and what should you use as equity. There's that interplay as well. but. On a more systemic basis, I think that we'd all want to see the rates come down to make it easier for companies to borrow businesses to, to, to borrow to invest. We'd like to see rates lower so that individuals, you and I, can take money and young people starting life can borrow money to, no, but to the buy rates, a house. Kweku, the rates are high. I won't go in for a loan now because it's so outrageous. I'm not going to pay. I'm asking. You, you, you are telling us to go for people are coming in private sector and other businesses are coming in. So what? The interest rate is still staying. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. What can we do now as private people to get our business going? Innovative ideas. What can we do? You can manage 
as well as you want to. Right. But that's what I was saying that you need a certain capital structure, a certain level of debt, your own invest um, equity. Okay, whether it's your money or other people's money, that's the equity equity component, mm. and then you need debt sometimes. So that's why I said that it's in our wider interest to get interest rates down, because when interest rates come down, it's easier for businesses to borrow. Not just that, it's easier for young people starting life to borrow, get a decent home. And pay over a lifetime. So how will the interest what, rates come down then? That's what happens. How can the interest the rates come down? How can the interest yes, rates? Yes, how can it come down? Uh, it'll. We need to see our macroeconomic environment improve. If it improves, you see the interest rates come down. It's happened before. Um, not too long ago, our interest rates were as low as sixteen point nine percent. So, and it could have gone lower. Right. Yeah. Now, government, you realize, went for a $1 billion euro bond um, with an interest rate of 10.7% and decided to issue $1.5 billion uh, Ghana cities. I mean, that was on a bond on domestic market, but mm -hmm. that was undersubscribed. In your estimation, was that appropriately used going for the money to pay debt? It's normal to want to refinance your debt if you can. If you can refinance your debt at, at a lower cost, why not? Oh. It's, it's, it's done everywhere in the world. So there's nothing wrong with that principle of refinancing debt to lower your interest payments ultimately. But you know it will have some effect, you know, huge effect on, on, on the economy. Looking at financial stability, debt's financial stability, what would that be? It depends on what the money is used for. Okay. But the money is not used for developmental projects just to pay debt. I owe this person I'm going to pay off oh, I owe I'm going to pay. So we are not seeing anything like development or anything, just that. Well, but we've been advised that it will be used to retire domestic debt. Right. If that happens, then exactly what you were asking me for a minute ago, that interest rates are too exorbitant. If government uses that money to reduce their holdings of, uh, or our holdings of their debt, then domestic interest rates should fall, all things being equal. Mm. So we are waiting to see that. So it is a good thing to bring the domestic interest rates down. So what you say? If government that's... refinances domestic debt, then there are, there's less domestic debt right. out there. So the domestic interest rates will come down. That's what should happen. Great. More with Kweku Bedu Ado, CEO of Sunday Chartered Ghana after the break. We'll be right back. The Hard Truth, Season 9 with Akusia Konedu. Proudly brought to you by Echo Bank. <laughs> We see a great future, one that's full of opportunity for those who want to be the best. With over 1,000 branches of a single bank across 33 African countries, it's a future where trade can flourish without boundaries. The future is breathtaking with enormous cross-border investments helping business and government build new infrastructure. While individuals achieve their ambitions right across Africa. The future is Pan-African and Ecobank is the Pan-African bank. Welcome back uh, to the Heart Truth Season 9, very first episode. And uh, Kweku Bedu Ado, uh, CEO, um, Standard Chartered Bank Ghana, it's my guest. Kweku, no, you said in our guest this year, I heard somewhere this year, that Standard Chartered Bank will cut credits to our private businesses because the economy is going through some challenges. And, but I'm asking, who brought these challenges? And why would you cut you know, credits to people like me? Every economy goes through cycles. Right. Okay? So you have recession. In the West, you hear they are recession, or they are going through a boom period. Right. So they are what we call economic cycles. Okay. So in Ghana, what what do we have at the moment? Uh, you see that the economic environment is very tough. What we term it as headwinds. The macroeconomic headwinds are tough. We see a lot of market volatility as well. Commodity prices have taken a tumble. It's affecting a lot of businesses. Mm -hmm. We've seen a lot of volatility on the foreign currency market since 2013. 
again, that has impacted a lot of things, a lot of businesses. So what it means is that the environment is not very benign to grow your loan book very aggressively. So when you are when you're facing such challenges, the normal reaction is to put on the brakes. But I thought share. banks are there to give credit to private businesses like Akosia and maybe or some sure you have a business yourself. So if you tell me because the atmosphere, the environment is not conducive for you, mm -hmm. then what what happens to my business? If I told you that I would lend you money oh. to buy a home, right, and I'll charge you thirty percent, would you take it? It depends. How long am I paying the loan for? <laughs> yeah, but 30% means, think about it, it means that in every three and a half to four years, you'd have paid back the principal of the house. Uh -huh. that's, that's too much. Yes, exactly. That's a lot. So why would we... It's, it's a lot. It's, uh -huh. it's, so the risks get heightened. And don't forget that the money that the bank lends out belongs to depositors, uh -huh and in a wider context, the shareholders of the bank. And so we also have a fiduciary responsibility to make sure that we take the right decisions for the stakeholders. So, so have you I'm sure you wouldn't want the bank that you put your money in to be reckless about how it, it, it lends the money. It's got to be careful and make sure that this money that is going out will come back. No, but Standard Chartered Bank, here for good, right? Mm -hmm. That's your tagline, here for good. So yeah. if you are here for good, if my business flourishes, yours flourishes yes. too. Now I need money telling me, cutting me off. I mean, I wouldn't buy that. The context was that the environment is, is, is more difficult and so we'll be more careful in terms of being careful. asset growth. Maybe I was quite harsh with my words. So being careful is slash cut. Cutting off, you won't, you won't give anyone loans or anything. No, no, that's, that's the, the word. word. People still take loans, companies take loans. Oh, huge, yeah. that's for the affluence. No, no, but you've got to be careful. I mean, that's the reality of it because it's other people's <coughs> money that they've entrusted in, in, in your hands, mm -hmm. and, and there are rules around uh, what they call prudential lending. You, you, you've got to be very careful what you do out there. Um, look, lending money is very easy. If that it, if that was it, then, uh, then paying back is an issue. Huh? What was the issue? That's easy. So what? Paying back is it's the issue. Well, you've got to make sure that money comes back. You've got to make sure that depositors' money is safe. Right. You've got to make sure that you generate sufficient return for the shareholders who own the institution. So in which cases won't you give loans to the private man? In which case? Because you are saying that's not true. You said that because this and that. So tell me. So if I'm coming for a loan now. In what shape should my business be to get a loan from you? Well, the, the most important thing they would look at would be, first of all, how do you run the business yourself? Okay, do you really know what you're doing? Are you on top of it? <laughs> Second, do you generate, does the business generate sufficient cash flow to pay back the loan? Right. Security is secondary. The more important thing is, does the business generate sufficient cash flow to pay back the facility? Security is just a fallback, you know. And there are people who borrow without security because their businesses are strong enough. They've generated a good track record over many years and banks are comfortable to lend to them unsecured. Yeah, so it's not true. If you think inside a shadow bank, you know, is cutting off private businesses, that's so not true. Just go with the right criteria and I'm sure you'll be giving your loan now. But let's look at competitiveness in banking sector now. It's said that, you know, indigenous banks are suffering in Ghana against the foreign banks. What's, what's the beef with that, indigenous against that? Really? Let's get their performances right, yes. I think over the years, they are doing well. Um, yeah. we, we begin to see indigenous banks grow and mature. And I think it's, it's good for the economy. Um, that every, every country I've been to, most countries I've been to, they have a very vibrant domestic... But, but um, I, I get but Have you seen the numbers? Go to NIB, go to Fidelity, go to ADB. Have you seen the numbers against you know, um, um, that of the big banks like yours and like Ecobank and, and banks like that. Huge deposits, huge profitabilities. Go ask them, they'll I tell think, you. I think, I think they are catching up. I think I've so seen... So how I've can they, maybe what I want to stories. ask you, sir, is how can they... I mean, they are doing better, it's fine, but it's better, okay. How can they do better? I mean, they just can't just do oh, fine. How but, can but, they do but better? But it's, 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 it's a journey. It's a journey. I mean, you can't overnight compare... Uh, domestic bank to 
a big international <coughs> bank in so many countries. Because some of them, some of the big international banks have a heritage for, for over a hundred years. So they've been doing this for a very long time. But it is good that we're seeing uh, Ghanaian-owned banks begin to emerge and begin to grow. And it's something that must be encouraged. We must encourage others to also come up. Mm. And over time, it will take time. It doesn't just, you don't get there overnight. But the important thing is you start a journey. And we see that that journey has started. So that's good. It will catch up. Yes, hopefully. Now, let, let's talk about bank uh, uh, penetration. You realize that penetration in banking in Ghana is about less, it's less than 20%. Yes. How can we catch up? Um, I think we need to all, as Ghanaians, you know, focus on financial literacy and financial inclusion. Um, just yesterday, we signed a partnership with Airtel uh, to work with Airtel using the Airtel Money platform. And that helps us to reach down back. That's great. You know, to get to the last mile. That's because great. Airtel will have very wide uh, distribution and reach within the country, including the unbanked. Mm. And so partnering with us, for example, makes it possible to get money to the unbanked and vice versa through the various supply chains uh, across several industries. So I'm, I'm, I'm just good. thinking, let's look at the general phenomenal bank penetration. Why mm. is that? Why don't we have you know, huge numbers, but you, you realize that on banks, it's still up about 80 or more than 75%. Why is that? I think if you, I, I'm sure I haven't looked at the detailed study or anything, but just conceptually, if you think about it, it would be uh, so many factors. The level of our economic development, um, I don't think people are unbanked not because they, they choose to be unbanked, but sometimes they don't even earn any income, okay? Some of it could be cultural, mistrust of um, large institutions who, which look sophisticated. Uh, I'd rather stay away from them. So there, there could be a cultural element as well. Oh, but you realize uh, you have some elite, they put their monies under their beds or somewhere in the house and keep it, it there. It could happen. What we need to do as society is to understand some of these root causes and try to stamp it out. But more importantly, let's improve the welfare and the income distribution in the country, make it a more equitable society. And I think that the more we do that, the more we will get people to transition into the mainstream economy and be part of the multi But do, do you think, I mean, I get that, but do you think that we understand the principles of banking, put your money in the bank for safety, put your money at home, people come to take it away, but still they still keep the monies at home, hide it on, you know, under the ground, keep it somewhere safe because they feel the banks aren't doing well. Do you think we understand the principles of banking in general? Well, I, I talked about financial literacy. Financial literacy must go hand in hand with financial inclusion. Let's look at the telcos and um, the banks now. How can they work hand in hand? I'm still looking at the banking penetration and bringing on banks there. How can we all collaborate, especially with the banks with the, and the telcos together? I think it's the future. It is really the future. The future technology will play a very important part in whatever we do. Mm. So it's in our interests, mutual interests, to, to, to cooperate with each other. Because as you rightly said, they have the reach, yeah, have the even to the unbanked. Right. I may not have a bank account, but I have a phone. Mm -hmm. And if technology makes it possible to convert money into bytes and move it around on a phone, why not? Mm -hmm. We've got to embrace it and, and use it and hopefully it will help us to make quantum leaps that earlier generations could not make by way of financial inclusion and financial literacy. So I think it's a positive thing. We'll be right back. The Hard Truth, Season 9 with Akusia Konedu. Proudly brought to you by Echo Bank. We see a great future, one that's full of opportunity for those who want to be the best. With over 1,000 branches of a single bank across 33 African countries, 
us a future where trade can flourish without boundaries. The future is breathtaking, with enormous cross-border investments helping business and government build new infrastructure. While individuals achieve their ambitions right across Africa. The future is Pan-African, and EcoBank is the Pan-African Bank. Welcome back to The Hard Truth, and uh, Mr. Kweku Bedu Ado, uh, Chief Executive of Standard Chartered Bank Ghana, is still here. Now, sir, let me just ask you, since you, you, you love, 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 love the public sector so much, would you want to get into politics someday? I think that I've saved almost a decade of my life working in the public sector as a technocrat. That was great. I'm in the private sector now. I'm having the benefit of combining both experiences, and I think that is good. Yeah. Um, so you I'm would want to be in politics someday? Would you want to be the president someday? Oh, no. I mean, I'm not in retail politics, if that's what you are asking. I'm not in retail Would politics. you want to be the president of Ghana someday? I don't think so. You don't think so? Why is I that? Think so. Um, I think it's a, it's a path that you've got to. If you want to be on that path, you, you, you get into a certain track and work towards that. And as you can clearly see, I'm in the private sector. I'm not in the, that track well, of doing things. Never so. say never. Never say never. Finally, as a citizen, a proud citizen of this country, it's our president, John Dramani Mahama, three years in office. Is he doing well, sir? I think that's, that's a question for Ghanaians to, to judge and make that decision. So what do you think? I don't think representing Standard Chartered, it's, it's for me to come and make um, pronouncements here because my personal view doesn't really matter in these, in these things. It doesn't? No, I don't think. But you vote Saturday, every, every, every yes, four years, all, exactly. So I, I have my own views and we have yours. What, what, what would you say, mm. being in office for three years, what can you advise the president? What, what would you tell him? If you see him now, what would you tell him? Well, the country has a lot of challenges and we all need to uh, put our hands to the wheel and try to resolve those challenges for the country uh, so that um, the people don't lose hope and faith in the system right. because it's the only country we have. And that's the advice I'll give any president of Ghana. So do you, do you think work that... With, work with do, do you think people. that Ghanaians are losing hope now? It's all lost here for us. Well, I think whenever I have time to listen to the radio and try to understand people and talk to ordinary people, there could be some element of despondency and... Um, gradual erosion of, of, of hope because of the difficulties and the difficulties have been um, quite challenging for even businesses. Mm. So we'd all like to see things turn around the corner and improve for everyone. But they will get better. for the most vulnerable in society. But it will get better, you think? Oh, definitely. It will get I'm better. an optimist. It will get better okay. if we all work hard at it. Kweku, thank you so much for talking to our dream. Pleasure. Kweku Bedu Ado, Chief Executive Officer, Standard Chartered Bank Ghana, and has additional responsibilities as Chief Executive Officer of Standard Chartered Bank West Africa Cluster 2. And that uh, this show is proudly brought to you by Echo Bank, the Pan African Bank, and uh, supported by Absolute Fashion in Jowalu and GH Kitchen in Osu, and my lovely makeup done by Diva. Thanks to Reflex Images, and uh, follow the Heart with GH pages on social media and catch a repeat on our YouTube channel. My name is Nana Akosia Kulod. Good evening. The Hard Truth, Season 9, with Akosia Konedu, proudly brought to you Band and vice versa, through the various supply chains uh, across several industries. Okay, so I'm, I'm just good. thinking, let's look at the general phenomenon of bank penetration. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Why don't we have, you know, huge numbers, but you, you realize that on banks, it's still about 80 or more than 75%. Why is that? 
I think if you, I've, I'm sure I haven't looked at the detailed study or anything, but just conceptually, if you think about it, it would be uh, so many factors. The level of our economic development, um, I don't think people are unbanned not because they, they choose to be unbanned, but sometimes they don't even earn any income, okay? Some of it could be cultural, mistrust of um, large institutions who, which look sophisticated, uh, I'd rather stay away from them. So there, there could be a cultural element as well. Oh, but you realize uh, you have some elite, they put their monies under their beds or somewhere in the house and keep it, it there. It could happen. What we need to do as society is to understand some of these root causes and try to stamp it out. But more importantly, let's improve the welfare and the income distribution <coughs> in the country, make it a more equitable society. And I think that the more we do that, the more we will get people to transition into the mainstream economy and be part of the more. But do, do you think, I mean, I get that, but do you think that we understand the principles of banking, put your money in the bank for safety, put your money at home, people come to take it away, but still do we still keep the monies at home, hide it on, you know, under the ground, keep it somewhere safe because they feel the banks aren't doing well. Do you think we understand the principles of banking in general? Well, I, I talked about financial literacy. Financial literacy must go hand in hand with financial inclusion. Let's look at the telcos and um, the banks now. How can they work hand in hand? I'm still looking at the banking penetration and bringing on banks there. How can we all collaborate, especially with the banks with it and the telcos together? I think it's the future. It is really the future. The future technology will play a very important part in whatever we do. Mm -hmm. So it's in our interests, mutual interest to, to, to cooperate with each other. Because as you rightly said, they have the reach yeah, have the even to the unbanked. Right. I may not have a bank account, but I have a phone. Mm -hmm. And if technology makes it possible to convert money into bytes and move it around on a phone, why not? Mm -hmm. We've got to embrace it and, and use it and hopefully it will help us to make quantum leaps that earlier generations could not make by way of financial inclusion and financial literacy. So I think it's a positive thing. We'll be right back. The. Understand some of these root causes and try to stamp it out. But more importantly, let's improve the welfare and the income distribution <coughs> in the country, make it a more equitable society. And I think that the more we do that, the more we will get people to transition into the mainstream economy and be part of the more But do, do you think, I mean, I get that, but do you think that we understand the principles of banking, put your money in the bank for safety, put your money at home, people come to take it away, but still do we still keep the monies at home, hide it on, you know, under the ground, keep it somewhere safe because they feel the banks aren't doing well. Do you think we understand the principles of banking in general? Well, I, I talked about financial literacy. Financial literacy must go hand in hand with financial inclusion. Let's look at the telcos and um, the banks now. How can they work hand in hand? I'm still looking at the banking penetration and bringing on banks there. How can we all collaborate, especially with the banks with it and the telcos together? I think it's the future. It is really the future. The future technology will play a very important part in whatever we do. Mm -hmm. So it's in our interests, mutual interest to, to, to cooperate with each other. Because as you rightly said, they have the reach yeah, have the even to the unbanked. Right. I may not have a bank account, but I have a phone. Mm -hmm. And if technology makes it possible to convert money into bytes and move it around on a phone, why not? Mm -hmm. We've got to embrace it and, and use it and hopefully it will help us to make quantum leaps that earlier generations could not make by way of financial inclusion and financial literacy. So I think it's a positive thing. We'll be right back. The Hard Truth, Season 9 with Akusia Konedu. Proudly brought to you by Echo Bank. We see a great future. 
One that's full of opportunity for those who want to be the best. With over 1,000 branches of a single bank across 33 African countries. It's a future where trade can flourish without boundaries. The future is breathtaking with enormous cross-border investments helping business and government build new infrastructure. While individuals achieve their ambitions right across Africa. The future is Pan-African and EcoBank is the proven excellent record not only in Ghana but across Africa. Their mission they say is to be a world-class shared service center for the Standard Chartered Group. Mr. Kweku Bedu Ado, the young, dynamic and enterprising chief executive officer of the Standard Chartered Bank of Ghana and the very first Ghanaian to hold this prestigious role. He has had far-reaching experience within the banking sector as well as several years serving within Standard Chartered Bank Zambia, Singapore, Cote d'Ivoire, Gambia and Sierra Leone. He will delve into his life as a banker, work ethics, motivation and also get some insight from him on the banking sector in Ghana. Now, do you think he has a muzzle to offer more than he already has? We would definitely find out in our brief yet probing talk with him. My name is Nana Akosia Kunedu and this is season nine of The Hard Truth. You're watching The Hard Truth and the uh, group CEO or chief, as a, no, he's not a group CEO, he's a chief executive officer of uh, Standard Chartered Bank Ghana and uh, with more additional responsibilities as um, to West Africa to cluster. So, welcome to the hard truth. Thank you very much. And uh, how are you enjoying your new role? Oh, I just started, but um, yes, I'm enjoying it. You are enjoying it, you can see from your face and your, from, your, from your nice suit. Thank you. <laughs> Now, you said that three key elements are to success within the banking sector. Uh, you know, that was what you said was the public sector. You know, you worked in the public sector and you also said that um, uh, you had some very good faith. So, Providence meeting uh, destiny and all that. And maybe your knowledge in um, general knowledge in, in Ghanaian, you know, settings. Why would you say this? Well, that's for my personal journey. Right. That is because. Oh. Yeah, I need you to tell me more about that. Well, because um, everyone has a different journey and personal experience. Mm. But if you're talking about my experience, then I believe you are referring to uh, probably an interview I granted a while back mm. about um, my early experience in the public sector mm. after university. Uh, the fact that um, it's a case of um, ambition meeting destiny. Mm -hmm. A combination of working in the public sector and private sector over time mm -hmm gives you a certain local knowledge and perspective that helps you to take decisions. Mm. So I think, but it, it takes time to get to that level of proficiency. But is the money not factor? Because you mentioned in some interviews that, you know, people work, when you work in the uh, public sector, you get some ideas and know-how when you would to transcend down to other businesses. But now we look at the money and we're like, no, we're not going to work there. So what, how was the experience like for you those days? I think it, it's something that everybody has to realize globally. Oh. It's mistrust of um, large institutions who, which look sophisticated. Uh, I'd rather stay away from them. So there, there could be a cultural element as well. Oh, but you realize I, you have some elite, they put their monies under their beds or somewhere in the house and keep it, it there. It could happen. What we need to do as a society is to understand some of these root causes and try to stamp it out. But more importantly, Let's improve the welfare and the income distribution in the country, make it a more equitable society. And I think that the more we do that, the more we will get people to transition into the mainstream economy and be part of the more. But do, do you think, I mean, I get that, but do you think that we understand the principles of banking, put your money in the bank for safety, put your money at home, people come to take it away? But still, they will still keep the monies at home, hide it on, you know, under the ground, keep it somewhere safe because they feel the banks aren't doing well. Do you think we understand the principles of banking in general? Well, I, I talked about financial literacy. Financial literacy must go hand in hand with financial inclusion. 
let's look at the telcos and um, the banks now. How can they work hand in hand? I'm still looking at the banking penetration and bringing on banks there. How can we all collaborate, especially with the banks with the, and the telcos together? I think it's the future. It is really the future. The future technology will play a very important part in whatever we do. Mm. So it's in our interests, mutual interest to, to, to cooperate with each other. Because as you rightly said, they have the reach yeah, have even office. to the unbanked. Right. I may not have a bank account, but I have a phone. Mm -hmm. And if technology makes it possible to convert money into bytes and move it around on a phone, why not? Mm -hmm. We've got to embrace it and, and use it. And hopefully it will help us to make quantum leaps that earlier generations could not make by way of financial inclusion and financial literacy. So I think it's a positive thing. We'll be right back. The Hard Truth, Season 9 with Akosia Konedu. Proudly brought to you by Echo Bank. At Echo Bank, we see a great future. One that's full of opportunity for those who want to be the best. With over 1,000 branches of a single bank across 33 African countries. It's a future where trade can flourish without boundaries. The future is breathtaking. It's in our interests, mutual interests, to, to, to cooperate with each other. Because as you rightly said, they have the reach, yeah, have even office. to the unbanked. Right. I may not have a bank account, but I have a phone. Mm -hmm. And if technology makes it possible to convert money into bytes and move it around on a phone, why not? Mm -hmm. We've got to embrace it and, and use it. And hopefully it will help us to make quantum leaps that earlier generations could not make by way of financial inclusion and financial literacy. So I think it's a positive thing. We'll be right back. The Hard Truth, Season 9 with Akosia Konedu. Proudly brought to you by Echo Bank. At Echo Bank, we see a great future. One that's full of opportunity for those who want to be the best. With over 1,000 branches of a single bank across 33 African countries. It's a future where trade can flourish without boundaries. The future is breathtaking with enormous cross-border investments helping business and government build new infrastructure while individuals achieve their ambitions right across Africa. The future is Pan-African, and EcoBank is the Pan-African Bank. Welcome back to The Hard Truth, and uh, Mr. Kweku Bedu Ado, uh, Chief Executive of Standard Chartered Bank Ghana, is still here. Now, sir, let me just ask you, since you, you, you love, 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 love the public sector so much, would you want to get into politics someday? I think that I've saved almost a decade of my life working in the public sector as a technocrat. That was great. I'm in the private sector now. I'm having the benefit of combining both experiences, and I think that is good. Yeah. Um, so you I'm would want to be in politics someday? Would you want to be the president someday? Oh, no. I mean, I'm not in retail politics, if that's what you are asking. I'm not in retail Would you want to be the president of Ghana someday? I don't think so. You don't think so? Why is I that? Think so. um, I think it's a, it's a path that you've got to. If you want to be on that path, you, you, you get into a certain track and work towards that. And as you can clearly see, I'm in the private sector. I'm not in the, that track well, of doing things. Never so. say never. Never say never. Finally, as a citizen, a proud citizen. In which case, because you are saying that's not true, you said that because and that's. Tell me, so if I'm coming for a loan now, 
in what shape should my business be to get a loan from you? Well, the, the most important thing they would look at would be, first of all, how do you run the business yourself? Okay. Do you really know what you're doing? Are you on top of it? <laughs> Second, do you generate, does the business generate sufficient cash flow to pay back the loan? Right. Security is secondary. The more important thing is, does the business generate sufficient cash flow to pay back the facility? Security is just a fallback, you know. And there are people who borrow without <laughs> security because their businesses are strong enough. They've generated a good track record over many years and banks are comfortable to lend to them unsecured. Yeah, so it's not true. If you think inside a chartered bank, you know, is cutting up private businesses, that's so not true. Just go with the right criteria and I'm sure you'll be giving your loan now. But let's look at competitiveness in banking sector now. It said that, you know, indigenous banks are suffering in Ghana against the foreign banks. What's, what's the beef with that, indigenous against that? Really? Let's look at their performances, right? Yes. I think over the years, they are doing well. Um, yeah. we, we begin to see indigenous banks grow and mature. And I think it's, it's good for the economy. Um, that every, every country I've been to, most countries I've been to, they have a very vibrant domestic. But, but um, I, I guess, but have you seen the numbers? Go to NIB, go to Fidelity, go to ADB. Have you seen the numbers against? you know, um, um, that of the big banks like yours and like Ecobank and, and banks like that. Huge deposits, huge profitabilities. Go ask them, they'll I tell think, you. I think, I think they are catching up. I think I've so seen, wh how I've can seen they, maybe what I want to stories. ask you, sir, is how can they, I mean, they are doing better, it's fine, but it's better, okay. How can they do better? I mean, they just can't just do oh, fine. How but, can but, they do but better? But it's, 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 it's a journey. It's a journey. I mean, you can't overnight compare a uh, domestic bank to a big international <laughs> bank in so many countries. Because some of them, some of the big international banks have a heritage for, for over 100 years. So they've been doing this for a very long time. But it is good that we're seeing uh, Ghanaian owned banks begin to emerge and begin to grow. And it's something that must be encouraged. We must encourage others to also come up. Mm. And over time, it will take time. It doesn't just, you don't get there overnight. But the important thing is, you start a journey, and we see that that journey has started, so that's good. It will catch up. Yes, hopefully. Now, let, let's look at bank uh, uh, penetration. You realize that penetration in banking in Ghana is about less, it's less than 20%. Yes. How can we catch up? Um, I think we need to all, as Ghanaians, you know, focus on financial literacy and financial inclusion. Um, just yesterday, your knowledge in um, general knowledge in, in Ghanaian, you know, settings. Why would you say this? Well, that's for my personal journey. Right. That is because oh. yeah, I need you to tell me more about that. Well, because um, everyone has a different journey and personal experience. Oh. But if you're talking about my experience, then I believe you are referring to uh, probably an interview I granted a while back oh. about. Um, my early experience in the public sector mm -hmm. after university, uh, the fact that um, it's a case of um, ambition meeting destiny. Mm -hmm. A combination of working in the public sector and private sector over time mm -hmm. gives you a certain local knowledge and perspective that helps you to take decisions. Mm -hmm. So I think, but it, it takes time to get to that level of proficiency. But is the money not factor? Because you mentioned in some interviews that, you know, people work, when you work in the uh, public sector, you get some ideas and know-how and you're able to transcend down to other businesses. But now we look at the money and we're like, no, we're not going to work there. So what, how was the experience like for you those days? I think it, it's something that everybody has to realize globally. Huh. It's very rare for a public sector job to pay more than private sector generally mm. as the general norm. In a few countries there's convergence. Uh, certainly my experience in the public sector was no better. The, the pay was not that exciting. Right. But, but I you think had some opportunities always but you know opportunities to, to learn you where you are now. Now you realize that we have all veterans there in the public sector, not giving the young people the chance to, you know, bring out their their best in them and shine from your time, you know, working in the public sector, how was it like comparing that to now? What would you say the differences are here? I think the, the challenges are the same. Um, when I worked in the public sector, that was when Ghana was going through structural adjustment 
and all that. Aren't we still going through that? Exactly. So that's why I say the <laughs> yeah. challenges remain the right. same. Um, bottom line, I think that we do have economic challenges that makes it difficult for the average person or the average household to have a, a meaningful life. Right. Uh, uh, life with with dignity and um I get about with what? hope and aspiration. Exactly. So that's that's what it's all about at yeah. the end of the day. So you got some opportunities perhaps we are not getting now, you know, in our generation. What mm. was it? How different was yours from now? Maybe uh, your boss helped you to do some I am not gonna say it for you, but how 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 was that now for you? I think what I would like the younger generation to understand that is that public service is not wasted time. It may not pay, it may not fill your bank account, it may not give you the kind of money you want to do all the things we all want to do. Right. 